Good afternoon. My name is Bob Hauser, and I'm the executive officer of the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to today's launch of the virtual exhibition for Dr. Franklin, citizen scientist. I'm glad that you've joined us today. The American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance, and it expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who have offered their guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. The ex exhibition you are going to hear about today was scheduled to open in April 2020 in Philosophical Hall, but the COVID-19 pandemic necessitated that we delay that opening for a year. In June 2020, the APS was very pleased to learn that it had been successful in its application for a highly competitive National Endowment for the Humanities CARES grant, funding made available in light of the devastating effects of the COVID pandemic on cultural heritage institutions across the United States. This provided the generous funding to keep recent PhDs, such as our speakers, as well as exceptional doctoral students employed during the pandemic. It also provided the funding to create our first ever virtual exhibition, that of Dr. Franklin, citizen scientist. The exhibition was curated by Andrew Mellon Foundation postdoctoral curatorial fellows, Drs. Janine Bolt and Emily Margolis. Dr. Janine Yorimoto Bolt is the 2018 to 2020 Andrew W. Mellon Foundation postdoctoral curatorial fellow at the APS. She is the lead cura curator for the exhibition, Dr. Franklin Citizen Scientist, and was co-curator of the previous exhibition, Mapping a Nation, Shaping the Early American Republic. Dr. Bolt is now Associate Curator of American Art at the Chazen Museum of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Janine earned her PhD in American Studies from William and Mary in 2018. Her current, current book project investigates the political function and development of portraiture in colonial Virginia. Dr. Emily A. Margolis is a former Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral curatorial fellow at the APS, and she currently serves as curator of American women's history at the National Air and Space Museum and Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Dr. Margolis holds a PhD in the history of science and technology from Johns Hopkins University, a master's in the history of science and technology from the University of Oklahoma, and a bachelor's degree in physics from Princeton University. She's a native of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. With that, it is my pleasure now to introduce Mary Grace Wall. Mary Grace is Associate Director for Collections and Exhibitions at the Library and Museum of the Society. She will explain the format of today's opening before handing it off to Drs. Bolt and Margolis. Thank you. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, thank you, Bob. The work of putting together an exhibition is not a small task, and it is the dedication of our small and collaborative exhibition team that makes it all happen. Like Bob mentioned, our 2020 exhibition, Dr. Franklin Citizen Scientist, was scheduled to open on April 3rd. By mid-March, at the time of the shutdown, the APS exhibition team was all hands on deck and everything for the exhibition was in our gallery ready to be installed. The opening of an exhibition is such a celebratory time for all of us, particularly our fellows, and especially the lead curator who is finishing up their two-year fellowship at the APS. As a result of the pandemic, we discussed many options for moving forward with the work that had been done. This forced the APS to rethink how we would showcase the exhibition when we couldn't safely open our doors. 
As a result, the decision to create both a virtual tour and exhibition catalog emerged. We had never done a virtual tour before and have only done a couple catalogs, but we saw these projects as a way to bring content that was developed to people much sooner than we could if we waited until we could open our doors again. While many museums and libraries have been forced to make difficult decisions, which have led to furloughing or even firing of staff, the APS has been very fortunate to be able to keep everyone working and creating the virtual tour and exhibi exhibition catalog in just a few months kept us all very, very busy. It has been such a pleasure working with these two scholars as they develop this exhibition. Janine and Emily's work on the exhibition, virtual tour and catalog was exceptional. And I'm so glad that you are all here to experience, albeit virtually, the exhibition with them through their eyes. And now just a little housekeeping before we get started. We are using Zoom webinar today, so not to worry, you've all been muted. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. You can type your question in there at any time, and there's going to be time at the end of the, end of the talk for the questions with our speakers. We're also happy to offer closed captioning for today. Uh, if you would like to use it during the program, please click the CC box at the bottom navigation bar of Zoom. It is to the right of the Q&A button. And now with that, it is really my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Janine Bolt and Dr. Emily Margolis. All right, thank you, Mary Grace and Bob for that introduction. Uh, and thank you everybody currently watching this program at home for joining us today. Uh, this is not exactly how I imagined opening or celebrating this exhibition. Uh, so I just wanna spend a few minutes thanking everybody who has contributed to Dr. Franklin Citizen Scientist. One of the themes of this exhibition is the importance of collaboration. And this exhibition would not have been possible without the other members of the exhibition team. Most importantly, my co-curator, Emily Margolis. Thank you for all of the snacks and the office dance parties, but most especially the knowledge and creativity that you brought to the ex exhibition. Thank you to Mary Grace Wall, who has served as a mentor and directed the exhibition virtual tour and catalog. Mike Medea and Ali Rosbund, our wonderful education team, has taught me so much about writing museum labels and have developed excellent educational installations around the exhibition. And they also developed the virtual tour for the youth tour of this exhibition. And to Magdalena Hoot for reading everything so closely and her essential work organizing objects, creating labels and working on installation among other things. So one bonus of this virtual format for the openings that I get to show you a few pictures. And I just wanna say again, I'm so grateful to the exhibition team for their collective work and how quickly everyone pivoted to creating a virtual tour and programming. Without the dedication of this exhibition team and other APS staff, the exhibition would not have ever been able to move forward from ideas in my head to this beautiful installation that you'll be seeing today. And as you can see, the process was no fun at all. And I also just wanna thank the APS conservation team for working on making sure that every object could be safely displayed and the facility staff for helping with all the lighting. Thanks to Patrick Spiro and Bob Hauser for supporting this exhibition and providing important feedback. I don't think that this exhibition is exactly what either of you uh, had in mind when I was initially asked to curate an exhibition about Franklin and science, but I'm grateful that you believed in the project. And thanks to Kyle Roberts, Dave Gary, and Brian Carpenter for sharing their expertise and reviewing all of the exhibition text. And while I don't have time to thank the rest of the APS staff by name, I want to express my sincere gratitude to everyone else at the APS who have shared ideas, their collections expertise, and provided essential labor to make both the physical and the virtual exhibitions come to life. And lastly, I want to thank Barbara Oberg, Emma Lobsansky werner B. Chapman-Smith, and Carla Mulford, who consulted with Emily and I and who reviewed our exhibition text. Thank you to our contractors who worked on the exhibition, virtual tour, and catalog. And thank you to the Library Company of Philadelphia and the Rosenbach for graciously loaning materials from their collections to the exhibition and allowing us to include them in the virtual tour and catalog. And thanks to Jessica Linker, Joel Fry, and Susanna Carroll for sharing the research and information with Emily and I. And with that, 
we will start taking you through our tour of the virtual tour of Dr. Franklin, citizen scientist. So Emily will be joining me on screen here and we will be uh, taking you through together. So this is our landing page for the Dr. Franklin Citizen Scientist virtual tour. And you'll see uh, all of the directions you need to navigate through the tour on your own on the home page. Today, we're gonna focus on the adult tour because that uh, primarily was what Emily and I worked on. But I also wanna draw your attention to the youth tour. Uh, the youth tour, as I said, was developed by Mike Medea and Allie Rosmond and has uh, made the content more accessible to younger audiences, particularly uh, middle school aged audiences. And we hope that uh, you'll check it out because it's great. They offer new perspectives on the exhibition and have chosen some different object highlights. So welcome to Dr. Franklin Citizen Scientist. Um, one of the major themes of this exhibition is actually inequality. And we wanted to think about how Franklin participated in a system of knowledge production that often reinforce and produce inequality. And we also wanted to focus on Franklin as what we might call a citizen scientist, that he believed that all people could and should engage with science and that science could transform society for the better. Um, and that he recognized that science take many forms and all people could produce useful knowledge. Um, and so those are the major themes that we'll be talking about throughout the exhibition. And as you move through the exhibit on your, by yourself at home, you'll see these video icons in which Emily and I have created uh, short videos of roughly two minutes each in which we discuss these themes at length. So this is our intro space and I just will quickly show you. As you move through the exhibition gallery, you'll see these yellow highlighted objects. These are the object highlights that Emily and I chose to highlight for the virtual tour. There are 92 individual objects in the actual tour and we had to pick only 30 uh, to write highlight information for. Uh, so when you click on them, you'll get a nice image of the object itself. And if you click again or click on the icon, it'll pull up a label. And these are unique labels that Emily and I wrote specifically for the virtual tour that expand on the actual labels that are seen in the physical tour because we wanted the virtual tour to be a unique experience and offer a slightly more informal approach to the exhibition, almost as if you were being guided by Emily and I uh, yourself as you go through it on your own. So we chose to include so many portraits, what we called the portrait wall in the intro space to highlight how Franklin was actively shaping his image as a citizen scientist, but also emphasize just how famous he was. Um, and, to, and as you'll see, we use his image throughout the exhibition to make that point about uh, who gets remembered and why. And people like Benjamin Franklin get remembered uh, very well. And we all know what he looks like. So to move forward in the exhibition, you click on these uh, white flashing beacons. So we'll move into the next space of the gallery. All right, thanks, Janine. Um, welcome everyone to the first section of our exhibition, which we've titled Transatlantic Currents of Knowledge. And we really wanted to open the exhibition by bringing visitors into the world of 18th century uh, um, science or natural philosophy as it was known at the time. And it's in this uh, small space that we highlight the institutions, ideas and practices that inspired and enabled Franklin's career as a citizen scientist. So this is sort of laying the groundwork for um, the stage that he, um, uh, for his rags to riches story. Um, so I just wanted to start off by sharing a few objects that speak to some of the features of 18th century science. Um, this is one of the challenges when creating an exhibition is telling the stories through objects that are available to us and objects need to be able to tell multiple stories. So I'll start off Janine with um, looking at Medicina Britannica, um, which is over here in this first case under a map of the Atlantic world. So this is Medicina Britannica. It's a household manual of medicinal plants found in England, organized alphabetically by um, common plant name. And it was created by botanist Thomas Short 
originally published in London. The, this edition that we're looking at here was reprinted in Philadelphia by Benjamin Franklin in his Philadelphia print shop on Market Street. And um, most notably, it features annotations in italics and an appendix at the end that were written by Franklin's friend and collaborator, John Bartram, who was a famous botanist and maintained a garden in West Philadelphia that was internationally known. Um, and what's really important about Bartram's remarks in this reprinting is that it makes this text that was intended for English readers usable for people who are living in the North American colonies. And some of the themes that this book represents is that um, the ways in which scientific knowledge circulated through the Atlantic world in the form of books, um, the fact that England and also North America were sites of knowledge production um, and that indigenous people were part of this knowledge production, although they are not credited by name um, in this book and many other texts. Um, and this uh, book also is a form of collaboration um, sort of informally with Short, but more formally between Bartram and Franklin. And one of the themes of the exhibition, as Janine pointed out, is that science is made through collaboration. Um, and the other point is that science, especially medicine, was a part of everyday life in the 18th century. This book um, was part of a personal library that did not just sit on the shelf, but it probably also came out in the garden, as you can tell from this plant specimen that we found sandwiched in between the pages. Um, not being a botanist, I did not, I was very excited to find this specimen, but I had no idea what it was. Um, and so much as Franklin turned to Bartram, we turned to Joel Fry, who's the curator of Bartram's garden today, for help identifying the plant. Um, and Joel suggests this might be a species of lavender. Um, we also had an opportunity while curating this exhibition to connect with some of the individuals who work at institutions that Franklin was affiliated with or founded. And so we took a field trip out to Bartram's garden last winter um, and Joel Fry gave us a tour um, and he also gave us a piece of um, a seed pod that came from the Franklinia plant. Um, we have an illustration of Franklinia here. Uh, you can guess its namesake. The namesake is Benjamin Franklin. Um, the illustration that we uh, have in the back over here was made by John Bartram's son. Um, and so this, uh, the seed was intended for part of a touch collection that we had anticipated installing, but due to the realities of COVID that, uh, that uh, has not been included in the exhibition. So I've, um, it's, it's been great to be able to work with these collaborators and also to work with such a flexible team uh, to be able to kind of overcome the recent challenges we've experienced. And then our uh, next section of the exhibition uh, looks at sort of Franklin scientific practices and accomplishments. And this corner over here looks uh, first at printing and the science of printing and at the science of water and climate. Um, and together, these two sections really bring home the idea that Franklin uh, was invested in trade skills, that he believed in the power of manual laborers to produce knowledge, that he respected uh, tradespeople and craftspeople, um, and that he was collaborating with them. Most of his great collaborators in Philadelphia and in the North American colonies were um, craftspeople and working class people. And he respected their knowledge and their labor. And so this section really brings that idea home. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple objects in the printing section. Um, all, I love all of this. I think this whole section is just really pretty, but we'll just focus on a couple of things today. I wanna to point out we have a bachelor's hall here. So this is believed to be the only surviving copy of this, of this special publication. So Benjamin Franklin printed this privately for friends. Um, he had told a friend named George Webb that he was planning to start a newspaper. And then George Webb went and told a rival, Samuel Keimer, about Franklin's plans. And then Keimer uh, ended up starting a newspaper first. And Franklin was pretty annoyed with him. Eventually, uh, Franklin forgave Webb. The two socialized at a place called Bachelor's Hall, which is located in the modern day Kensington uh, neighborhood in the late 1720s, early 1730s. And he forgave Webb for what he did. And he published Webb's poem called Bachelor's Hall. And he laid it out really lovely. He, Franklin designed all of this sort of um, adornment, uh, these, these ornaments, he laid out all the text and it's considered probably one of the most artistic pieces that Franklin ever published. Um, and this is one of the things where I love working at the APS because Dave Gary actually brought this one to our attention and encouraged us to think about including in the exhibition. And it's a really wonderful piece and we included it in this exhibit about science 
because we wanted to uh, really make it clear that Franklin was a very skilled printer and he would use those skills throughout his career. Um, but they started here as a working class printer in Philadelphia. So we have some other nature prints and inventions that Franklin had, but today I wanna bring your attention real quick to this stencil set, just because it's really cool and it wasn't one we could include in the virtual tour. Uh, Franklin remained interested in prints for all of his life. So we have that 1731 publication of Bachelors Hall, but then we have this uh, stencil set from the 1780s that Franklin had specially produced in France. And it has a various different font type set that allowed Franklin to, or sorry, stencils, but that Franklin was using to create calling cards and letters and things. And so he, he maintained a lifelong interest in print. Um, and we just thought these were really cool. And uh, so for a fun sort of Easter egg in the exhibition, when we were trying to figure out how to display it, uh, we had the idea to spell out names. And so if you look carefully, you can see we spelled out Deb, Jane, and Ben, who are three of the most important people we highlight in the exhibition. And then we turn into the water and climate section. Um, again, you can explore this on your own, but one of the other pieces I wanna highlight that we did not get to include in the virtual tour is right here, and it's Franklin's meteorological observations and imagination. Uh, so Franklin speculated about water and climate theory all the time, and he proposed that like international scientists today, uh, that there be international cooperation to study weather patterns and climate around the globe so that we could better understand uh, how climate worked and to better prepare people for natural disasters. Um, and so this is a really fun essay. It got published um, and in it, he's, he's thinking about a really harsh winter that had just occurred. And he speculates that there's like a level in the atmosphere that's all ice. And that's where sort of water and rain and hail come from. Um, and so we included this in the, in the actual exhibition so that we could link it to modern um, climate science and think about how Franklin's theories still sort of relate to what climate scientists are doing today. And then um, another object that we didn't get a chance to feature in the, um, well, I guess we, here it is. Um, so this is the cane. This is um, kind of an unusual object. Um, this does not look like a normal scientific instrument, but in fact, it was really important for some of the science that Franklin was doing. Um, so this cane is made of bamboo and it has sort of a, um, a bone style handle. What's special about it, I mean, of course, this is not any ordinary cane. This is one that's similar to one that Franklin would have used um, that he carried while living in London in the 1770s. And so in this handle, there's actually a reservoir for oil. So Franklin filled this cane with oil um, and walked around town, um, didn't provide any benefits for his walking, was actually so that he could do scientific experiments and demonstrations. Um, so there's a very famous story of Franklin walking around Clapham Green one day in London, um, and he comes across, across the pond in Clapham Green and he releases the oil from the reservoir of the cane onto the pond and it stills the waves that were on the surface of the water. And whenever I read this story, I always like to imagine crowds of Londoners ooing and eyeing over this uh, phenomenon that they had just witnessed on our, their stroll in the park. Um, and I think that this cane really speaks to a lot of Franklin's um, practice, um, but as well as his personal qualities, he certainly understood that science um, could be a spectacle and that it could entertain as well as educate. Um, and the theory behind how the oil stills water is uh, something that Franklin first read about as a child. Um, one of the few books that he remembers his uh, parents having in their home library in Boston was Pliny's Natural History. Um, and so in this book, he read about how oil could still the waves. He later observed this in practice on one of his many transatlantic crossings when um, the ship's cook released some cooking oil into the water and it sort of dulled the wake of the ship. Um, and then later on, Franklin experimented um, himself using uh, uh, tools like this cane. Um, so this really speaks to how Franklin's scientific practice was all encompassing. It included reading and engagement with theory, as well as observation and experiment. Okay, this is the moment that everyone's waiting for. The first thing anybody thinks of when they think of Franklin and science is electricity. And it has been um, an honor and a joy to be able to work with Janine to help bring the story of Franklin's electrical research 
to all of you and to the visitors that will come through the, the exhibition. But if there is one thing that I ask you to take away from our day today, it's that Franklin did not invent electricity and he did not discover electricity. So if you hear anyone say that, please direct them to our virtual tour and learn why. So far from the lone genius, uh, Franklin built on the work of electricians that were working in Europe um, in the early 1700s. And he also collaborated with people in Philadelphia, his colleagues, as well as his family um, to study electricity. Um, so this, this part of the exhibition is the largest section on his science. Um, as as Janine had showed a second ago, um, we start with a set of objects that sparked Franklin's interest in electricity and electrical science that um, we have a glass tube that was used to generate static electricity um, along with a scientific publication that talks about um, electrical research in Europe. And together these two, um, these two items uh, sent over by Peter Collinson, a London patron of colonial scientists, got um, a, a bunch of uh, Franklin and his colleagues at the Library of Company to be interested in electricity. And we move from here all the way through his scientific writings, his publications, um, as well as the applications of his research. So this includes things such as how electricity could possibly be used to treat medical ailments, um, to the lightning rod and its ability to protect homes um, from electrical storms. Um, we feature objects that speak to some of the renown that Franklin received for his electrical work, including um, an honorary diploma um, from Harvard University and also a, an award that he received from the Royal Society of London, the Copley Medal. Um, so we really try to show what Franklin's scientific practice was like, how his, um, his knowledge was generated and circulated, who he worked with, um, what the applications were. And we also try to talk about the ways in which science became a part of public life and how some of these scientific demonstrations reinforced um, and reproduced structural inequality, including in this um, colored engraving here, where you can see how um, wealthy individuals are looking on as a woman who's on a, um, an insulated pedestal is becoming charged and then will shock um, the African boy here on the um, because he's not insulated and it's connected to ground. So um, we, we, we kind of get a sense of what Franklin's electrical research was like, but within the context of what everyone else was doing at the time as well. Um, and so just to very briefly highlight um, one of the objects in this section, which is really exciting for me if I could um, describe it as anything, it would sort of be like Franklin's um, admissions letter. So this is like when he, he makes it big and he's corresponding with his patron, Peter Collinson, um, and he's sharing all of the knowledge that he's gaining from working with the electrical tube and starting to work on his own experiments. Um, and Collinson writes to him in this letter above the case and says, this is really great work and we're going to publish it in London. And this is Franklin's big break. And the books that you see underneath the letter in this case are um, the first and fifth editions of um, experiments and observations on electricity made at Philadelphia. And this is the first scientific bestseller, you might call it. Um, this is really what helped make Franklin's name as a scientist, which then led to his um, appointments um, to political positions. So then our, our next section in the exhibition looks at science as it was practiced in the home. Uh, we wanted to highlight the fact that there wasn't really a sharp division between public and private uh, spheres in the 18th century, that science could take place in institutional settings and, and labs and workshops, but it could also very much take place in people's houses. And so in this section, we highlight things like, you know, the Franklin stove invention that Franklin experimented with and installed in his own house. Um, but this section also gave us a great opportunity to highlight uh, women's contributions to science. And so I'll just briefly highlight two objects in this section. Uh, the first is this soap recipe that was written by Benjamin Franklin's youngest sister, Jane Franklin Meekum. And over the course of about 20 years, the brother and sister um, corresponded about crown soap regularly. And Franklin asked Jane to send him a, a recipe for the family's crown soap recipe. And he uh, apparently tried to make it, it's unclear, um, but he never quite mastered it. And we know this because in this, the second edition of Meekum's Crown Soap Recipe, it says at the top that my brother in his lifetime told me it could not be conveyed by recipe, that it sometimes worked as he could not account for it himself. 
Um, so in other words, Franklin can never quite master how to make crown soap. And I really loved this because on the one hand, it's fun to think about Franklin, this great genius, being unable to master crown soap uh, and soap making. Uh, but on the other hand, it, what it really does is highlight just how um, much skill is involved in a trade science like soap making. And so it was really important for, to Emily and I to think about um, soap making, candle making, cloth dyeing, printing um, as science. Um, and as a type of science. Um, and that off, they often get overlooked in the history of science at large, but Franklin himself obviously took these sciences very seriously. And so we wanted to take them just as seriously. Um, and so we, we really love this recipe um, by his sister about how to make soap. And then the other object I'll highlight here is this beautiful portrait of Deborah Franklin. So this is uh, the only known surviving portrait of Deborah Franklin and the APS is lucky enough to have it in its collection. Uh, so what we like to highlight with Deborah is that she's often overlooked or dismissed in studies of Franklin and science. Um, but the reality is she was essentially Franklin's business partner. She helped him run the shop, the post office. She was part of his scientific network. Uh, when he traveled, she facilitated sending him letters from his colleagues. She even sent him specimens at times. Um, and her labor was absolutely essential. Um, she also served as hostess when Franklin would host scientific gatherings in their Philadelphia home. And we wanted to make sure that Deborah got the respect she deserved for all of her labor in this exhibition. Um, and this is a pretty modest portrait. It's fairly, you know, it's fashionable. Um, Franklin actually is believed to have hung this copy in his London home. Uh, because there's a record of him having um, another of her portraits copied so that he, one could stay in Philadelphia and one could hang in, in London. And this is a London copy of a, a lost original. Um, so Franklin respected her too and had a copy of her portrait with him. And uh, although it's very modest and sort of a simple portrait, it sort of um, covers the fact that Deborah herself was uh, pretty awesome and you know, she lived by herself for a long time and had to run the Franklin businesses and Franklin absolutely was dependent on her. Uh, when people in Philadelphia were angry at Franklin for his actions during the Stamp Act, uh, Deborah armed herself and, and uh, defended her home in Philadelphia. Uh, so we really liked Deborah and we wanted to give her pride of place in the exhibition. And then this section here uh, was the heart, I would like to say, I think the hardest section of the exhibition to put together because it deals with some pretty sensitive content. But also because of that, it's arguably perhaps the most important section of the exhibition. Um, we've called it the observations on humankind. And we look at the early study of human difference, you know, what would evolve into racial science in the 19th century. And we think about Franklin and his colleagues and how they were involved in studying um, uh, human difference and studying and engaging in unethical or unscrupulous practices um, of studying you know, enslaved people for the pursuit of science. Um, so in this case here, uh, we've included transactions by the Royal Society and transactions of the APS. And in both of the publications that we have on exhibit, uh, they deal with these um, institu unethical institutional practices. In the royal transactions, we see in this paragraph here, this has been an overlooked article in studies of Franklin, um, but you can read it for yourself. And, and basically it says that while in London, uh, Franklin received from Deborah, his wife, uh, who is still in Philadelphia, specimen from a young child's head. And this ch young child was enslaved and had uh, what we now recognize as albinism. And she collected some of this child's white hair to send it to Franklin to study. Now, people like Franklin and his colleagues uh, often studied people with albinism and vitiligo because their, um, their appearance sort of uh, was unusual. And scientists believe that they were the key to understanding whether or not uh, black people and white people were actually members of the same race or not, or the same species. And so they were often uh, publicly exhibited and examined. And then here in this APS transactions is an article by John Morgan, who went on to found the Philadelphia Medical School at the University of Pennsylvania, in which he writes that at a meeting of the APS, uh, that the APS members displayed and exhibited uh, two young enslaved children uh, for the examination of APS members. And their names were Adelaide and Jean-Pierre. And then he went on to publish this very explicit and graphic description of their bodies. 
And so with these two publications, we're talking about how Franklin and his colleagues uh, were discussing this topic. And later on in this section, we feature an object that has great um, connection to what's going on today. So like us, Franklin live in, lived during a public health crisis as a youth in Boston and later in Philadelphia, Franklin witnessed his neighbors succumbing to smallpox. Um, and in fact, he and Deborah lost their four-year-old son Francis to the disease. Um, and so Franklin uh, was a lifelong proponent of um, inoculation, which was a practice that um, Boston um, a physician introduced to the United States, but he, this physician had in fact um, acquired this information from an enslaved man, Onesimus, who was working, um, who had uh, brought this knowledge with him from West Africa. And so um, this is a pamphlet that sort of speaks to the, the movement of, um, the movement of medical knowledge between Africa and, and North America. Um, and uh, also in, um, it, it's also very personal to Franklin. And so um, Franklin promoted this, this practice of inoculation and he wanted to appeal to others who, um, because the practice involved um, injecting someone with live disease. Um, he wanted to sort of uh, provide data that spoke to the efficacy of this practice. Um, and so he, you can see a, a, a chart here where he's uh, providing statistics on survival rates of individuals who were and were not inoculated. And he breaks these statistics down by race. And this really shows the ways in which race is ever present in the thinking of scientists of this time. Um, and just a, a quote that, that Janine and I found to be really, um, really re relevant today from Franklin when we were thinking about, when we're rereading this through the context of the COVID pandemic that we're living through now. This is something that um, Franklin shared. He said, I long regretted bitterly and still regret that I had not given my son Francis a uh, um, smallpox inoculation. This is because Francis had un underlying conditions. He couldn't be inoculated at the time. This I mentioned for the sake of the parents who omit that operation on the supposition that they should never forgive themselves if a child died under it, under the inoculation. My example showing that the regret may be the same either way and that therefore the safer um, should be chosen. And I have to imagine that Franklin would have a lot to say now um, as the vaccination program is beginning across the world. So um, in this last section of the exhibition titled Benefit of Mankind, um, this is where Janine and I really talk about the ways that Franklin used his privilege and wealth to support the next generation of American leaders in science, medicine, and other fields. So we start off with Franklin um, as a young colonial scientist looking to England for patrons. But by the end of his lifetime, he had acquired so much wealth and status that he was able to be a patron to um, scientists in the young United States. Um, Franklin's legacy is alive and well throughout Philadelphia today. I'm sure um, anyone who takes a walking tour through the city can find Franklin's um, e evidence of, of institutions that he founded everywhere. Um, he, in this section, we highlight the institutions that he either founded to promote science ed and education or he patronized. These include the University of Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Hospital, um, and of course, the American Philosophical society. Um, and so I'd like to show an, an object here that I think is specifically relevant in this moment today um, as we approach the grand conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. What better, better object to talk about than an astronomical um, article that appeared in the very first issue of the Transactions of the American Philosophical Society. Um, here we have a, a, um, a diagram that was made by local scientist John Ewing when he observed the transit of Venus over, over Philadelphia in the 1760s. Um, and it was published here in this grand foldout. This is, this is perhaps one of the largest cases we have in the exhibition. Um, the book is on the right and then the foldout is this large piece that, that comes out on the left. And so what's really important about the transit of Venus um, is that it was observed internationally by scientists all over the world. And by being able to participate in this observation of this astronomical event, which allowed astronomers to determine the distance between the earth and the sun, um, this sort of said, you know, Philadelphia and the American Philosophical Society in particular are um, equal players in the scientific networks 
international scientific networks moving forward. And that um, is in part thanks to Franklin's efforts to found this institution and to um, and serve as its president over many years. And that brings us to this last wall, which we were calling sort of the epilogue to the exhibition. Uh, so what we have here is sort of a reflection on the differing lives and legacies that Franklin and his youngest sister, Jane Franklin Meekum of the Soap Recipe, um, they're, they're contrasting lives and legacies. Um, and so we titled this little epilogue, Lost to the World, and took inspiration from a letter that Jane Franklin Meekum wrote to her brother. And this letter is probably my absolute favorite thing in the entire exhibition. And it actually inspired the entire exhibition's narrative of sort of looking at issues of inequality. Um, so in this letter, it's from 1786. So they're, um, both siblings are quite old. And Jane writes in this paragraph here that, you know, she wonders how many thousands of Sir Robert Boyles, Samuel Clarks, and Sir Isaac Newtons have been lost to the world and lived and died in ignorance and meanness, merely for want of being uh, placed in favorable situations and enjoying proper advantages. Very few we know are able to beat through all impediments and arrive to any great degree of superiority and understanding. Uh, so in other words, like what she's talking about is what we today might call structural inequality, right? That some people are born into privileged positions and have an easier time in life and have better access to education or scientific institutions, medicine, you know, what have you. And uh, Jane Franklin Meekum died uh, quite poor. She had 12 children. She had to uh, essentially support her entire family because her husband was unable to support them. And she relied on her brother for money and help in the, her last years of her life. And we wanted to think about this and the fact that they were brother and sister who grew up together in Boston, came from the same background, and yet they led such very different lives. And today, everybody knows who Benjamin Franklin is, but not very many people know who his sisters are. And so we ask visitors to just think today about how inequality continues to shape and affect society and, and perhaps how they can, can, and you here watching today can continue Franklin's mission to use useful knowledge for the benefit of all of humankind um, and to make the world a better and more just place. Uh, so that is the end of our exhibition tour today. I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Uh, Emily and I are very happy to answer questions that you may have about the exhibition, the process, the virtual tour. Um, and we also um, are happy to be running a sort of a giveaway today. Uh, we'll be giving one lucky winner a physical copy of the catalog for the exhibition. And so my colleague Mike is about to drop a link to a quiz in the chat. And the first person who responds correctly will win the a copy of the catalog. And the question uh, in this quiz was inspired by Jane Franklin Meekum. So good luck. <laughs> and uh, we'll start taking questions. Great, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Janine and Emily. It's, uh, no matter how many times I might've heard about the exhibition from either of you, it's always great to hear a little bit more and see uh, a tour of the, of the exhibition myself. Um, it, it's just always mind boggling in so many ways. Uh, so as questions kind of pour in, I'll try to track back through some that were submitted a little bit earlier on and see if we can get those answered. Um, and then Grace, this actually might be one for you um, about how can visitors and, and Jimmy and Emily too about like your own kind of navigations of the virtual tour themselves, but how can visitors go through this exhibition at another time by self guiding? Sorry, I was muted. Um, well, uh, I think I would need clarification on the question. Do they mean uh, the actual virtual tour itself? Or of course, we're gonna open our doors, hopefully sometime in April, 2021, that's our plan, is to open the exhibition and have it run from April into December uh, next year. So um, anyone can come at any time when we're open. And I would encourage you to check our website for developments of when we can safely open again. As far as the virtual tour, you know, I would encourage you to go on. Um, you can zoom in to objects kind of bigger to take a look at them. Um, but really the highlights are the ones that have kind of are, will expand out so you can see the label text and whatnot. Great. Thank you, Mary Grace. You're welcome. Uh, 
next question is, is a, uh, so the exhibition mentions Franklin's scientific pursuits and celebrity that eventually lead him to all these political appointments. And uh, throughout your research processes and throughout the process of creating the exhibition, did you find his involvement in politics or in the revolutionary causes uh, interrupted that those kind of practices and those uh, involvements interrupted his scientific pursuits or shifted them into a different direction? Yeah, so Franklin, I mean, he never entirely gave up scientific pursuits and writings, obviously, but he turned towards uh, his career as a diplomat and politician. And he, he strongly believed that his, or his po political service, his political uh, positions and appointments were more important and of greater contribution to society than his science was. And so his science took a back seat. Uh, he became a great patron uh, to individuals and to institutions, and he still promoted science and actively engaged in science, but um, he really began to focus much more on his political career. Um, and there are a couple of quotes throughout the exhibition where, you know, we, that we use and we put on the wall or in the catalog about just how important he saw his public service. Um, and so his, he launched into fame in the 1750s and then you know, really became an international politician following that. And so does Emily want to add any more? Yeah, I think just to illustrate everything that Janine shared, we have an object on display that is really exciting. It's a handwritten passport that Franklin wrote for the British explorer James Cook. Um, and he wrote this passport to ensure that Cook would have safe passage um, while navigating the globe on scientific pursuits during the American Revolution. So this is an example of Franklin using his status as Minister Plenipotentiary when he was in France to issue this passport to support science. So even though he may not have been uh, doing experiments himself, he understood inherently or believed in the inherent value of science to improve lives. And he wanted to make sure that a geopolitical conflict did not interrupt that process. Yeah, and it's a, it's a fun sub-theme of the exhibition. It's just kind of balancing out Franklin's timeline and knowing where he was, when, and what he was doing. It's a difficult timeline to create and work with. It's all over the place. Um, speaking of timelines, when, <laughs> kind of, uh, when were uh, Franklin's writings on inoculation published? Oh, okay. I'm gonna look that up real quick so I make sure I don't get the, the date wrong. <laughs> the one that's on exhibit uh, was published in 1759. Uh, so we often give cre credit to Franklin for being kind of ahead of his time and having all these legacies that live on through today. And, and I, I like this question. I think there's a the poignancy to it. Of what do you think provided Franklin with such foresight, essentially? I mean, I will just say that in reading about Franklin, reading his writings, he was endlessly curious. And I think that because of that, he was always interested in what was going on in his neighborhood and in the world. And he was constantly reading, even from his youth working in a print shop. He had access to ideas and, um, and concepts and people from all around the world. And I think in that way, there are some um, issues that are evergreen, you know, thinking about our climate, thinking about public health. And because Franklin was so engaged in in society and it was always reading um, and learning and connecting with people through his networks in some ways I think that that facilitated his ability to be um, a citizen scientist a public servant who was engaged with the, these scientific topics in a way that was productive yeah and I don't know necessarily what gave him a ton of foresight but I think his his background as a working class man and how he struggled in his early years also prepared him more than like the elite natural philosophers to work well with others and to just think more about society's needs and, um, you know, to respect people from different backgrounds. Right, it kind of gets that heart of the APS mission of useful knowledge instead of just knowledge and it, it really connects so nicely to all of that. Um, so this, this question embedded in it is also a lot of praise if you can see the Q&A <laughs> function. Um, so, so the overall question though is, do you think Franklin will be vilified for the fact that he owned uh, enslaved humans early in his life? So we, we address Franklin and slavery in the exhibition. We didn't uh, show any sort of highlights specifically about that uh, in our virtual tour, but the, if you go through on your own, you'll see a little bit more. Um, he didn't own enslaved people. Uh, there's actually no evidence that he ever freed any of them. And his writing on abolition and slavery is sort of uh, a mix. And historians haven't fully reckoned, or actually not reckoned not the right word. Historians don't fully agree 
on whether how dedicated Franklin was to abolitionism um, and why he suddenly became an abolitionist very late in his life. And it, his writing on these topics are sort of um, confusing, right? Because on the one hand, he started, he became president of the Abolition Society, but the fact is he never, there's no evidence that he ever actually freed any of his enslaved people. And actually when he died, he was living with his daughter, Sally, um, and Sally and her husband, Richard Beige, actually owned an enslaved man named Bob. Uh, so there was still an enslaved person in Franklin's household when he died and was president of the Abolition Society and was actively speaking out against slavery. Um, and in his will, he writes that he's leaving, um, I think it's land or property, but he's leaving money essentially to Richard Beige in the hopes that uh, the Beiges will use this to free Bob. And um, it makes you wonder, it's like, yeah, it's great that he did that, but why didn't he provide for Bob sooner? Um, and so there's a lot of... Um, mixed questions about Franklin, just like any of the other founding fathers. I don't know if vilified is the right word, but we need to reckon with these complicated pasts, like these complicated humans, um, and to fully understand what they were doing, the legacies that they've left this country, we have to understand and reckon with and, and learn about, you know, the darker side of their histories, as well as all the good things that they did. Um, and I don't know if Emily wants to add more to that. That's well said, and I just encourage everyone to go through the virtual tour and to, you know, read about um, Franklin's perceptions um, of um, enslaved people through his own words. I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about being able to work with the APS collections is that we don't have to guess what Franklin was thinking. We can we can read that for ourselves, and I think there's a lot of benefit from going to those primary sources. So we invite you to to do that. Yeah, and I think it's so sincerely appreciated that both uh, you and Janine took that part seriously, where that history is recorded pretty well and not kind of shying away from that, that it is present in the exhibition, it's present as a theme throughout the exhibition, which is really an opportunity, like you said, Emily, that is rarely presented um, so, and taking that as a, as a good kind of accountability there. Uh, a, a more lighthearted question of sorts. Uh, so while learning about Franklin, what surprised you the most? Mary Grace, if you have an answer in there as well, feel free to throw that in. Um, so one of the things that surprised me the most isn't actually strictly about Franklin, but it's actually about the, the women in his life. I actually had not, um, was not fully aware of just how influential his family was to him um, and how interesting like Deborah and Sally are because there's not necessarily a ton written about them um, and his sister Jane. And I was kind of surprised at how strong and um, courageous these women were and all of the great things that they did and that all of them had different scientific pursuits of their own. So you, I was always hearing about Franklin and science um, and I, I knew a lot of basic stuff about Franklin and science, right? But then I was reading more and more about the women in his life and I was just sort of floored at the various activities that they were engaging in that have so often been overlooked. Yeah, and similarly, um, in this scientific home section, we also feature a woman named um, Polly Stevenson, who Franklin, she was essentially a, almost a member of Franklin's extended family. Franklin boarded with her mother when he was living in London. And reading the letters that he exchanged with um, Polly really, um, it was enlightening because I, I haven't seen too many examples, not to say that there aren't examples, but they're not ones that are well known of young women who are engaging in scientific inquiry in the 18th century. But here we have Polly writing to Franklin, you know, as long as the book of nature is open to me, I'm never bored. There's always something for me to learn or study. And I thought that was so beautiful. Um, so, uh, I know there are many, many more people like Polly out there, but um, it's really through this example of because she was part of Franklin's orbit, we get to learn who she was. But there's a lot of folks, folks who have been lost to history because they, they, um, you know, don't have that connection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that were, uh, so so uh, there's another question in there that I'll, I'll just kind of pop in there about what sort of hands-on activities we find for younger visitors to uh, give them a sense of Franklin's science. Um, we had planned a whole section of the exhibition just for those kinds of demonstrations to talk about Franklin science. Uh, we have a demonstration light in jar even to use during these kinds of programmings. Um, we're working on figuring out what that looks like for in-person visitation in 2021. So more on that soon. Uh, but our website and the youth tour have plenty of activities for um, a variety of ages as well. I couldn't resist that question. Both of you know that. <laughs> um, so 
And Eric Grace is a good one for you to hop in on too, I think. So were there any objects or stories you were unable to include for whatever reason that you feel would strongly enrich or have even changed the stories you tell in the exhibition? I'd probably say the fellows would not say that <laughs> I'm encouraging more objects ever. Uh, I'm the exact opposite. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. I mean, I think that I think I'm just... I'm very impressed with what they selected. It's hard. It's hard in 1,200 square feet when we have so much, especially with the topic of Franklin and science, and we have so much material. Uh, whittling that down to the material that has to that gets end up being shown in a way that's very palatable for everybody is a really, really um, is really, really hard. But I'm sure that Janine and Emily have have favorites that didn't make the cut that I might not even remember or know about. You know, I move on very quickly. <laughs> I'll just say, you know, it was the way that we worked collaboratively. There was this big wall in the office and every time an object was up for consideration, we would have it on the wall. And then eventually some things would be taken down from the wall. And I always tried to do it respectfully <laughs> and make sure that paper was recycled. But like, it's hard because you do all this research and you kind of become attached to these objects and their storytelling potential. But that's when, when we have limited square footage, we have to pick objects that can tell multiple stories at once. Um, and it was challenging, but incredibly rewarding. And I can't say enough about the colleagues that we have who supported us through all of that. Yeah, I mean, 92 objects that may sound like a lot, but like, Ideally, we'd have a hundred more, right? And we could have a hundred more from the APS collection. Um, I don't know that any of the, anything would have changed the stories we told. I think Emily and I, from the beginning, had a, a fairly clear idea of the major themes that we wanted this exhibition to, to talk about. Um, but I just, as a material culture and sort of art historian person, there were some beautiful like books and printed materials that <laughs> Dave Gary helped pull for us where I was just like, oh, these would be so beautiful in this exhibition. And they just they just had to be cut because they didn't, um, we, we didn't need them. They were sort of extra to the story. Um, and then it would have been great if we could have included um, more about the really brilliant French women that Franklin uh, was um, socializing with in Paris and Passy. Um, we have some material by Madame Brion um, but he corresponded with other really smart women who are engaged in science, uh, Madame Lavoisier, the chemist. Um, and it would have been really wonderful to include more about these French women in the exhibition. But unfortunately, there just wasn't a lot of space and or the objects we had from them didn't necessarily cover the scientific topics um, that we wanted them to talk about. Great, and it's amazing what happens when you're having fun answering questions, but somehow it's already 1.59. Uh, so I think that had to be the last question. Uh, we'll keep all these questions anyway, and then uh, hopefully a follow-up email will be able to answer some of them as well. Um, so we do want to respect the, the great questions that have come into the chat function. Um, as I check the other form too, or the contest form for the catalog, there are about 17 responses. So that's going to be something that we have to trek, trek through before we can even say who won that at least. Um, so that'll also go in the follow-up email uh, and we'll reach out to the folks who either submitted their response to that form or the, the winner slash winners possibly, uh, depending on timestamps. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today for this virtual launch of the tour of Dr. Franklin, Citizen Scientist. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you have a chance to look through the tour more in depth on your own, watch those videos, and really engage with the content that Janine and Emily have worked so hard to create for the public and always check out that youth tour as well uh, along the way. Uh, but thank you from the APS for joining us. Stay safe if you're in the area and dealing with snow and have a happy 2021. Thank you.